Okay. We are live. Uh, I see the attendee counts going up. Just in just a minute, we'll start with the intros. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, the topic for today's webinar is what can developed economies learn about resource management from developing economies? Um, I would like to change the nomenclature of developed economies and developing economies a little bit based on our con based on the conversation with our panelists. We're going to refer to them as the Global North or and Global South, which is a United Nations defined term. Basically, Global North and Global South are terms that denote a method of grouping countries based on their defining characteristics with regard to socioeconomics and politics. According to UN Trade and Development, the Global South broadly comprises Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Asia, excluding Israel, Japan, and South Korea, also excluding Oceania, which is, uh, it includes Oceania, excluding Australia and New Zealand. Um, essentially, yeah, the Global South at large refers to the developing economies. So Adam Reed, Chief Sustainability and External Affairs Officer at Suez UK, will moderate today's webinar. And he is talking to Jose Alejandro Martinez, Director of Sustainability Department for Institute for Sustainable Entrepreneurship at EAN University. Uh, he, we also have Dr. Manzoor Ali, a solid waste management expert as one of the speakers, and Swati Singh Sambhyal, who's an expert capacity development for the waste manage, for the waste and marine litter program at Grid at Endal. We've received some few of sent in your questions in advance, have been they have been sent out to our panelists. Other than that, please use Q&A for your questions. We also have some interesting polls, so stay alert. Over to you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, depending on where you are in the world, which is the interesting thing about today's session, because it's very geographically diverse, I hope. Uh, yeah, I'm Dr. Adam Reid, and I spent uh, the last uh, seven, eight years at Suez here in the UK focusing on UK policy, but I do have... Uh, a history to share with you, which is somewhere around the years 2000 to 2010, I spent most of my time overseas working on donor funded projects, which is where Mansour and I know each other from from old. I used to work at uh, ERM, the consultancy working on projects for DFID, the World Bank and such like. So I've always had an interest in what's going in or what's going on in those geographies that perhaps UK policymakers, even the European Union policymakers don't look at don't think about. They think about them in terms of donor funding and their development, but don't think about them in, in terms of uh, sources of information or even best practice. So today's session is very much a, a, a reaction to that. It's kind of like, is it time for us to revisit where we get best practice from? Can policy in the West, the North, develop, your, take your pick, um, really learn from what's going on in Asia? Uh, in Africa, in Latin America. And so we've got three fantastic speakers today to just give us a little bit of insight, to give us a little bit of what might be happening, but also to, to, to talk about why, in their opinion, um, the European Union, North America, the UK perhaps could, uh, could really learn and, and, and build on some of the great work that's happening overseas right now. So that's it from me. I'm setting the scene. My job's to make sure all of your questions get asked. So don't be shy in getting them into this fantastic panel. And, um, and I'm going to invite each of the speakers to give maybe four or five minutes of their perspective, just to sow the seed, because I think the conversation is going to be really important. But I do want to ask a poll question first for the audience, because I'm really interested in sort of, I guess, where they are in terms of their appreciation of this topic. So Sweta, could you bounce us up a poll question, please? So the question is simple, audience, and you've only got a yes or no. Would you agree that the global north can learn from the global south on better resource management? It's a yes or a no. Don't opt out. Vote away. And keep those introductions coming in as well, by the way. It's great to see the webinar chat. There's some fantastic locations already in Malawi and India. I'm loving it. Uh, this is a truly global group today. Uh, while we're waiting for the vote to come in, let's just say hello. Mansour, are you well? You weren't expecting that, were you? Um, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Good. Yeah. Alejandro, all good? Hi, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, please receive to me a warm uh, regards from Colombia, <laughs> the other side of the Atlantic. <laughs> Thank you. And hi, Swati. 
how's, how's things? Hi, Adam, and hello, everyone from Delhi. Fantastic. So, what have we got in scores on the doors, please? Wow. 89%. I think they've all come to the right session, haven't they? 89% think yes. Well, given that we're going to start with, uh, with uh, Alejandro, um, you've got a great platform. 89% of the audience think that the Global North can learn from the Global South. So tell us about it. This is great. Uh, thank you so much, Adam. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, the, the, the global conception is, is different uh, when you are in different parts of, of, of the geographical health. Really, uh, I'm in Colombia, and for many years in Colombia, the south is Latin America, and the north is North America, and mainly USA. Yeah, uh, maybe maybe not Canada or, or Mexico. No, no, it's, it's USA. And uh, for a lot of, for many years, really, uh, the technological advances, the uh, good practices, all the things are thinking in USA, USA, USA. Yeah, uh, with the pass of the years, uh, we uh, saw another geographical area, Europe. Uh, and the uh, West Europe is okay, is, is, is the other north, yeah? And you say the, the uh, advanced technologies is from Europe or from USA and no more. But this is, is uh, complex because uh, we uh, believe that uh, we uh, doesn't uh, uh, understand or know around the South, around our partners, around our, our neighbors. Uh, uh, understand or, or uh, obtain uh, knowledge uh, from, for example, Peru or Brazil or Argentina, Chile, uh, the Caribbean, the islands. Uh, you, 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 can you uh, uh, learn something about Africa? Years ago, this is crazy to think in this. But now we have a, a new world, really, with the technology, with the info uh, possibilities, uh, with the internet, all of, all of this, this webinar, for example, the networks uh, can us uh, to teach and learn around the world. And it's uh, very significant, uh, the new conception of the global south and the global north. We are partners, we have the same problems, we have the uh, maybe the some solutions or the possibility to, uh, to share knowledge and to advance in the solution, in the particular solution for our region. Uh, solid waste is a common thing, it's a common thing really. Uh, I produce solid waste, Adam produce solid waste, <laughs> sweet, <laughs> measure all, everyone. Huh? But uh, we have some conditions in some countries, maybe economical, maybe cultural, maybe social uh, behaviors, I don't know. But uh, the, the science and the principles are the same. If you take the knowledge and take the experience of the others, you can surely approach to the real solution for your territory. I think that is a, is a good possibility to open your eyes and see the world, the big world. Very passionate, Alejandro. Thank you for, for setting the scene so beautifully. And, uh, and I think you've highlighted, you know, one of the key issues for me, which is um, technology. Not, not so much waste management technology or resource management technology, but you talked about technology as a means of sharing. And the fact that, you know, whether you're in Pakistan or Papua New Guinea, you can watch a YouTube video or, you know, um, a, a live feed from a, a site somewhere else in the world um, and, and learn from their experiences. And I think that's a really powerful tool in today's socialization of good ideas and, and best practice. So, so thank you for identifying that. I, my question for you is, is your rubbish similar to my rubbish? I think that, yes. <laughs> we might come back to the differences in our, in our, uh, in our recycling and, and, and waste production later. But thank you, Alessandro. And thank you, everybody, for introducing yourselves. Right, next up, Mansour. It's been a while. We've, uh, we've done some projects in the past, but not for a while. So... How's things and, and, and what's on your mind? Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, everybody who is listening. And thanks, Reta. 
and panelists. So I was very excited about this topic because I thought about it uh, lots of time and there was no panel or no research. We talked about South-South and North-North and all that. So I was quite excited and looking forward to, to speak. I thought about a few points. I must alert everybody that uh, although I worked in low-income developing countries for more than 40 years on solid waste management issues and challenges currently involved in a large program in Tanzania. Uh, but I have uh, less experience of uh, planning or designing anything for any developed country, um, much less experience. I mean, I would say maybe one project or half project. So I'm an ob observant as far as the rich countries are concerned, but I, I, I learn more uh, on those countries, uh, which are, we call them developing countries. So I would like to uh, share a couple of slides to, to help with this discussion. Let me see if I can share the screen. So I think this, yeah. Can you see this screen now? I can. Put it yeah. in okay. full. Uh, I'll make it full, yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yep. So what, I thought I thought about an example and 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 a clear clear case so for this this webinar. We have people from many countries uh, attending. So so my 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 key point from um, from the thinking and observation experience is that citizens uh, are active actors in waste uh, in waste management or waste recycling or waste involvement in low income countries. Um, this may be because of there are weaker policies or weaker regulations or no policies, but they participate in one way or another way in waste management. Um, so waste waste is a day-to-day -day discussion topic in, in many low-income countries. Um, they separate waste. I remember my mother and my mother-in-law and my grandmother, they used to separate waste and they spend, um, you know, good time to negotiate the rates when they are selling to the uh, waste buyers in the street. So waste waste was important for them and that money which they earned was important for them. Uh, clean cities is often a political agenda. Any political party comes, first thing they do, they start clean up campaigns. So so we, we don't see uh, that in developed countries because in developed countries, the, the, it is, it is not, it's, it's quite different. And my next slide is about that. Uh, community groups organize waste services. There are often discussions in the streets, in low-income areas, slum areas, on what to charge, how to charge. This this waste collector came. That waste collector did not come. So it is it is an important, and they they burn the waste. They make complaint. So whether it's positive or negative or constructive or destructive, waste uh, is a topic, and there is activity in waste management from citizen by the citizen. So that's my first point in this slide. If we move to, the, I can go to the next slide actually. I'm asking you to move. So in the North, uh, and I, I think we know, most of us know, uh, I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad thing or good thing, but uh, uh, it is the passive recipient of the service. So waste, my waste collection was done this morning. This afternoon, I'm sitting in Loughborough, UK, and uh, and I, I didn't know what time they came and, and I, I even don't know how they are paid and how they are financed. So so ex active participation of citizen may not be needed. Uh, but when things change and we start talking about circular economy and recycling and waste reduction or behavior change, I thought a lot of time that we don't have we need to th rethink about the data we collect, the, the way we analyze, the definitions we have. Um, and we need to look at the bigger picture. And there's, I think in this picture, I feel there's a very good opportunity for North to learn from the South. So just two examples to wrap up this discussion. Um, very close to my house, uh, three miles, there is a very big car boot sale. And in the UK, the car boot sales are where the people bring their older things, used things to sell. And it's quite a busy place, actually. So there are at least 300 cars and uh, and thousands of, of uh, buyers come, maybe many from, from low-income groups, but also some from middle and high-income. But it's quite an active thing. 
Kabul sales uh, have very little involvement of the government and even they stop here uh, during the flood season, rainy season, they struggle with the land, they struggle with the traffic management and all sorts of things. You don't see any official presence of municipalities in the Kabul sale, right? Although what they're doing, it's a very important thing for waste management. The second example I would like to talk in my town, which is a population of 40,000 people, there are 16 large charity shops who, who sell uh, used materials at a much lower, and they are quite busy. Now, I know they, they employ people without wages. Uh, I know they are under threat from the, the very big taxes, and they are not considered usually by the government or society. They're doing something to do, improve the base situation um, in the in the town. All the work they're doing is very important to reduce the waste. So, so my key question or key learning from these examples uh, and the context I explained that do we need to rethink about the, the definition of waste and shall can you know can we talk uh, and we, can we call waste as a resource rather than waste as a service or waste as a problem as we used to call in the north because now we have very different targets on waste reduction and recycling so i stop here adam and uh, again thank you very much for the opportunity stop no. sharing the screen now thanks thanks man so i mean that's a really fa fa i mean i know you've been around this space a long time but i think it's fascinating that you you, you look at passive and active as, as a way of looking at the citizen experience, because you're absolutely right. I think, you know, the, the, the West, the North, the developed, the rich, whatever, we've got a very, very out of sight, out of mind mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the rubbish men, the, the bin fairies, you know, whatever they, you know, you, your phrase for your garbage collector, um, come early in the morning, you might not see them, your bin disappears. Um, it goes somewhere, the magic happens, and, and somebody tells you you've got a recycling rate of 43%. Well done. Um, and that's kind of it. And the, the only time you really have an active engagement is, is when your bin goes missing or you haven't had a collection. Um, and suddenly you start talking to the service providers and you start talking to the local authority of the mispack. And I think that's kind of interesting because then it's quite um, confrontational. Um, and you don't have that embedded understanding or, or a role in the system. So I think you've really identified um you know something that's quite that, that's quite prevalent in and a very key differentiator i mean alejandro given given the latin american experience it would be quite similar to what Mansell's talking about in terms of some of his uh, experiences in, in in africa and asia it's you know there's so much more touch points for residents in terms of resources and waste handling similar we have a we have a a, a situation that uh a lot of uh, people uh, like like waste pickers, really, informal and formal waste pickers, uh, die by day using the resources for for the suburb or activities. is is yep. crazy because uh, it's not it's not with the formal. The formal has a, a small or medium companies. Maybe has a truck, a small truck. It has a, a some space for 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 the processing, but. The, the main quantity uh, we know more or less only in Bogota, in the capital of Colombia, we we have more than uh, twenty thousand people, informal people, waste wow. pickers. It's, it's a lot of people with bad conditions, and we need to 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 change in a good way all of this. We need to put. Uh, uh, Add value for the for the for the resources for the ways put a uh, new new processes put technology put uh, invest uh, put money and uh, and give a, a real work a real job uh, 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 it's, it's about it's about environmental justice really uh, with this time yeah, it's, yeah. it's so strong and it's the same in all Latin America, in all Latin America and the Caribbean, is 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 not is not different in Colombia. Maybe in other countries is worse. Thank you. It's um, it, it's it's a fascinating kind of development question, isn't it? That we've got huge amounts of engagement and lots of citizens involved in the system, albeit informally. Many of them, you know, generating a revenue or or an income. Um, and yet, when you try to formalize them, 
that's when the problems, you know, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to do what they do in the West or in the North and we're going to put them into systems and we're going to pay them and we're going to me mechanize it. And, and everything just starts to become really difficult because either culturally it doesn't work or we're imposing the wrong system. And I think that that kind of, that kind of a relationship in transition is, is probably the biggest hurdle that we've got in terms of taking, you know, your, your kind of scenario, Alejandro, or, or, or Mansell's and, and making it feel a bit more like the West. I'm not necessarily sure that making it like the West or the North is necessarily the right answer either. I think sometimes just because we do it doesn't mean it's right. Um, and we might come back to that question in a minute. But let's, let's bring Swati in. How, Swati, how's, in India and Southeast Asia, is it similar or, or is it different? Uh, I mean, very much similar to the perspectives that, uh, um, you know, Mansoor and uh, uh, Alejandro shared. But, but maybe I have a few slides, uh, Adam, to take you and, and uh, our panelists and participants uh, through, uh, majorly about perspectives from South Asia. So, of course, Alejandro touched upon Latin America and Mansoor widely talked about some of the issues in Africa, Asia. I'll deep dive further into South Asia. Um, I hope you're able to see my slides. Yes, oh, good. Um, I would like to lay emphasis on the importance of frugal economy, which is something that's very prevalent in uh, you know, countries in South Asia. Um, being frugal is acknowledging and knowing the importance of wealth and resources to ensure that they are not wasted. And that I feel is the fundamental principle of resource management that's practiced in countries in the global South. Um, Looking at South Asia, uh, you know, from, from a standpoint view of resource management, we know that millions of people from India and South Asia, they, they make their value by extracting resources from waste. So if you look at various waste streams, uh, most of them are opportunities in disguise for both the informal and formal sector. Um, South Asia's informal economy is perhaps the largest agglomeration of already existing circular economies. And it's also, uh, you know, a, a stepping stone for the formal economy, who in many ways relies on and appropriates the values produced by the informal economy. So it's more like a symbiotic relationship that exists between the two in our countries. Um, from data, more than 80% of all South Asia's workers engage in informal activities, something, Adam, that you highlighted upon. And, and for us, um, and, and for most of our economies in the global south, I think informal sector is the backbone of resource management. Um, moving ahead, some of the areas where learnings can be derived from in South Asia, one of course is repair economy and product life extension. Uh, secondly, affordable digital and technological innovations to increase traceability, resource recovery and material quality. Third, uh, existence of a lot of inclusive business models and circular market innovations. And last but not the least, policy innovation, which a lot of its progress that we have seen in, in the past decade. Um, starting with repair, what we've seen is that the culture of repair exists everywhere in our cities, you know, at the cornerstone of a colony or as you walk through, you would be you would easily find someone mending textiles or shoes or electro electronics, something or the other. But these are, also not, these are also not pockets that are widely mapped. They're very, very local in nature. So obviously there's a need to recognize repair practices and decentralizing funds for these practices in one pos is that's one possible way of moving ahead and acknowledging you know the culture of repair in our countries uh, but also we know that there's a standing threat of you know planned obsolescence the low quality of products which in some sense hinders repair culture this is something that uh, countries in global south are also facing um, i'll skip uh, some of the examples uh, to keep notice of time um, the second point on affordable digital and technological innovations, we have empty of examples that are in practice in South Asia. Um, I can give an example in India where we have something called the India Plastics Pact, which is a consortia of 40 plus brands that have pledged together uh, to work on circular economy for plastics packaging. And they've set targets for themselves all the way till 2030 to achieve. We have Kiabsa which is an innovative startup uh, that looks into resale of branded pre-owned clothing in India. Uh, there's Banyan Nation, which is quite famous. It's a recycling startup, which aims to recycle recovered plastic and ensures that it is of high quality. 
so that it can be used into packaging products, reused back again. And we have a few FMCG takers uh, from Banya Nation. Um, Fool is another entrepreneurial venture, which is based on circular economy principles, and it utilizes flower waste, converts it into various incense products, and employs women from low-income um, backgrounds. Um, last but not the least, and very important, because policy strengthens implementation is uh, you know, the roadmap for effective policy change that has happened in countries in South Asia. Um, in the recent decade, we have seen that several South Asian countries have created policies, uh, not only to deal with waste in a manner that reduces incineration and landfilling, but also, uh, you know, progressive policies that are looking into zero waste management, incentivizing segregation and uh, circular economy and innovation. Um, if you look at India, we have mainstreamed our waste management rules for various streams and have also laid emphasis on zero waste practices, garbage free and legacy waste free cities. Uh, we've also seen similar parallel efforts that have been undertaken in Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan and Sri Lanka. Plastic bags, ban bag bans is something that's widespread in South Asia. And of course, you may question about its implementation, but and it also includes um, plastic items that are of low quality that only cover a subset of hard to recycle plastics. But I, I do want to be very positive about it, that it's a step in the right direction. Also, the work on EPR, both on plastics and e-waste in India, is something that is remarkable, considering the wider complexities that we face between the formal and the informal sector, and is something that could be studied. Um, my last slide, Adam. Um, what we need for both global north and south, I feel it not has to be a one-way train, but we need learnings two ways. Um, of course, there are several lessons that could be exchanged on environmental governance and planning, on compliance enhancement and monitoring, where a lot can be learned from countries in the global north. Also, strengthening technical capacities of stakeholders by facilitating exchanges between global south and north. This is something that exists as a part of various forums and platforms, but I think we also need to acknowledge various geographic conditions uh, um, and then sort of map country to country to derive our learnings from. And learnings from social and frugal innovation that is widespread in South Asia across the global South, uh, which we feel, uh, which I feel, and I'm sure even Mansoor and Alejandro will agree, this needs better documentation and also documentation from an economics and finance financing angle so that you know these learnings can be more widespread so i stop here um thank you no thank you very comprehensive uh, swati and uh, there we go with her, uh, her email so any of you want to follow up with swati afterwards please do so um I, you, there's some brilliant examples in there and, and you've really provoked the audience which is always good um there's a few questions here about you know formalizing um the informal sector and you've kind of alluded to some of the you know some of the um the projects that are underway uh, is a question for all three of you are there really good examples can you point to me to a city or to an organization where you go they really got informal coming into the system and creating i guess a hybrid approach where we've not over formalized them and, and ultimately you know that that's failed but we've, we've got it to work i mean Start with you, Swati. Is, is there a, another example, or is there one from your your sheet there that you want to really, really focus on? Sure. Um, I think of examples of uh, cities. Perhaps we do have many examples uh, in in India where resource management is led by informal sectors. So there's a city called Ambikapur in Chhattisgarh where there's a cooperative of four forty women uh, that manages waste of a population of roughly about. 2 lakhs, 0 0.2 million, collects it on a daily basis, so segregated, then it's brought to primary centers, seg secondary centers. The city also claims uh, to be a zero landfill city. I've visited here and I think the resource management practices are commendable. I mean, we talk about two-way segregation, four-way segregation, 10-way segregation. They segregate into 156 different categories. So it's so it's mind boggling wow. of seeing this happening on the ground and it's the informal workforce that leads it. I think from experience and from these examples, another city where we have this very famous swatch model that's run in Pune. I think whenever the authority and empowerment is given to informal sector, those models really work well. So I think we really need to define what we mean by integrating informal sector. 
uh, wherever they are empowered, wherever there are benefits in terms of livelihood, social security, maybe a pension scheme, maybe a health insurance, those models work perfectly well. But if you mean integrating them as just hurdling all of them into an MRF facility, uh, you know, they're like daily wagers and then they come and go. Um, they are migrants at the end of the day and, and there is no benefit or incentive from them after a particular you know time span. So I think we really need to define integration. This is something that I often ask myself, you know, when we mean an integration of informal sector, what do we really mean by it? Because there's so many examples, many that have failed and a few that have worked. So I think it's very important to uh, derive learnings. And as I mentioned, often when we look at case studies, we miss the economics of it, what worked you know, the financial mechanisms, I think, which really need to come in the front. Most often it's not shared. Like even I spoke of just examples, not the financials. So I think it's very important to look into integration in a holistic manner, wherever that exists. Uh, those are our case studies, I'm sure, across the global south. And where it's not, not I mean, those models, of course, falter. Yeah. Thank you. There's um great chat, by the way, those of you that aren't watching it, um, a reference to a tier fund project with South African and Chilean examples of, uh, of uh, associations and, and integration. Alejandro, is there any particular case study you want to highlight? Well, uh, in uh, 2016, uh, years ago, eight years ago, um, we, have, we had a, a, a new policy around the waste management in Colombia. And uh, the policy said, uh, okay, we need to, uh, we need the transition from the linear economy to the circular economy in the solid waste man management. Okay, that's good. But uh, we have a, a, a strong things because we have a, a lot of people that don't have the money to uh, uh, invest in uh, their uh, use or reuse or uh, technological process for their waste. We have money for landfills. Uh, it's, it's, it's a real world. And we have to, to, to work in, in this way for the safety of the, of the communities. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a first problem. The second problem is that the social problem, really. All the waste pickers is, is an, in a long way for the recognition of their rights as a, a workers of the, of the waste is a is a law <laughs> force is is with jewels with laws with liars and after this uh, this uh, fight uh, the laws say okay please the waste pickers have rights with the waste please um, in the in the systems in the municipalities work together. But it's not easy to, to say work together. It's around uh, how is the logistic for work together? What is the uh, the the timing for uh, uh, the recollection of, of the waste? Uh, the recyclable uh, part is is a lot of um, operational things that the people have to to say. Okay, well, come on, work together. Uh, in small parts of the cities, the main cities like Medellin or Bogota, or in small cities uh, very close to the capital, like Cota or, or another, uh, uh, the the mayor say, "Okay, come here in the table, uh, work together. Please talk. What do you need? Uh, what do you need? Uh, please, come on." And it's possible, yeah. But uh, when you go rowing in the problem, rowing the cities, uh, uh, increase the number of the people, you have more complex situation to integrate the uh, semi-formal processes of the waste pickers, the associations of waste pickers, and the companies that take the waste and go to the uh, landfill. It's, it's, it's a business. It's, it's, Two yep. different business, really, and Very different. In, in other in other way, you have you have uh, companies that using the recyclable uh, materials to process in its um, main circular economy, but is with money, with uh, trucks, with uh, the contacts, with uh, agreements with the other companies is 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 a, the formal version. But what about the inclusion? of the people is so difficult because oh it's my company is formal and you are a way speaker i don't want to to work together because you are um, different well it's, it's not only laws 
is not only economic and financial things. It's a social, cultural, and behavior things that we have to work together. Now, in 2024, uh, we, uh, we are working in the new law for uh, the new policy of the waste uh, management in Colombia. And we are talking about resources and circular economy. But the big question is, okay, integrate the systems, really. Think in resources and not in waste. Uh, I think that this is the moment to know the other experience, to know experience that Pune uh, or the uh, other uh, cities and to integrate maybe pilot projects. Uh, I think that the, the, the solution is uh, step by step <laughs> uh, and uh, take the experience and uh, use, it, use it for, for the construction of the solution. Thank you. Lots of good stuff going on. Mansour, let's switch a question to you. You talked a bit about reuse and repair. We, you talked about it being sort of embedded in, you know, the, the culture that you grew up in with your mum. It, it, it seems to be prevalent across the global south. You know, you've all talked about sort of reuse and repair activities and, the, you know, the informal circular economy happening just by nature. So the question that a few people are asking me to ask you is how can we implement that in the north? You know, how do we weave it into social fabric? Because it's the norm in your geographies. It was the norm in my geography in about 1940. And the last 70 years has been about making it not the norm. It's been about consuming. It's been about single use. It's a, and then it was about recycling. But the whole idea of reuse and repair kind of not only became unfashionable, it also became uneconomic. And I just wonder, how do you embed some huge cultural shift to, to the past that actually is the future? Because I'm fully convinced about the role of reuse and repair in the future of our you know, of, of a economy, not just a circular one, just the economy. So what, what do you think, man? So as somebody that, you know, got brought up that way, how, how do we make that more interesting, more accessible, more normal for for the North? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Adam. Yeah, no, this is this is important. So one one simple way is uh, is the promotion and acceptance of the reuse. So within my area, which I'm quoting again and again, apologies. We the, the local authorities have tried to set up within that system the reuse uh, uh, shop where you can pick up things and leave your things. For example, use bicycle, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I tried to buy and give things on at least a few times and I found that nobody's there because the most of the stuff there is, is interested in in filling the bins, monitoring the vehicles, and sure. they do. So although they have this commitment of uh, this percentage of reuse and recycling, there's lack of ownership and there is lack of sincerity in the North that we do that. I, I remember 20 years ago, I took a, a student's visit to the uh, to a, a recycling center here, the, the transfer stations and all that. And uh, they made a very good observation that uh, uh, why all this good material is not picked up and 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 reused? So that is that is one thing, and I think the second thing is the 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 poor people in many low income countries are productive, right? Yeah. So we have a we have this issue uh, a serious issue that uh, the definition of the low income poor or unemployment are very different in the north. So we we declare them. Uh, easily that they depend on the government and, and whatever skills and, and curiosity or um, anything left there, we kill it or we don't, don't accept it properly. So I think those things are really important that we open that space of youth. I mean, we, we, we love to call these, uh, you know, we love this, this word startups, <laughs> but actually we, if people are self-employed or individuals and all that. So as I gave, I, ma'am, I, I give, I'm giving all my personal examples, but my, my son is hard of hearing and uh, he was struggling to find a job. Uh, he, so he is profoundly deaf. And uh, very simply, he worked in a charity shop for 12 months and he was not paid any wages, uh, but he got the experience to get the job. So very simple thing that uh, this acceptance that can this be a training center, then can, can this be apprenticeship uh, area? Can, this, can they have some honorarium? I think what uh, um, Alexander and Savati are saying uh, 
the, the common sense sometimes, the basic management, and some of those things are missing. And that is why recently I'm uh, quite uh, 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 vocally talking about that we we should not uh, flow too much in this direction of trade unions, of waste pickers. And, and so they are very important in certain contexts, for example, Latin America. But uh, in, in, in some countries, uh, they are meaningless. And what Professor, Professor Joe Beal from LSE, she was my mentor uh, for many years. She said that, look, we need to really use the common sense. Basic management and common sense is what required. There is no need to go for all these big dreams, which may not deliver anything. So I stop here. Uh, and thanks for the for thanks for the question. No, no, not at all. Thanks for the insight. Um, I've got a question for all three of you. We're going to start with with Swati. So it's a question. It's a question that's been bouncing around. A few people sort of mulling this one. Cultural practices in the South of developing economies contributing to effective resource management. I guess reuse and repair are a good example, but I'm sure there's others. So these cultural practices, how, how can we in the North respect them and integrate them? Because that's the ultimate transition for me is if, if there's stuff happening in the South and the, the question about reuse and repair is just one example. But if, yeah. if we can if we can learn from that, that to me is an, is an absolute game changer. So what, what's your thoughts on that, Swati? Yeah, um, I can just... Uh move the audience into my household, you know, and I'm sure every person in South Asia does that, which is uh, which is like uh, every month you sort of stock your recyclables, be it paper, be it plastics that's recyclable, be it glass bottles. And, and there is that station in every person's house, however big or small, you know, there is that little corner wherein you stock everything that is recyclable. Um, and, and then, you know, a kabari wala or what you call um, it's 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 basically the first person in the plastic waste value chain that collects waste from your from your doorstep, a house's doorstep, and and uh, there is an incentive mechanism for me or any maybe I give this to this person for free, but ninety five percent of the households will get some money from this person, you know. So for taking my waste, he will give me some money, and then he'll further sell it at two to three rupee extra and then the chain goes from an interim trader to an epic trader to finally a recycler this is a common practice and i think it comes very culturally to us because this has been going on since generations i i go a few generations back um, and and what usually used to happen was that old clothes were often stocked because uh, our mothers or grandmothers could exchange it with utensils so there would be someone who would who would come at your doorstep they would take all those old clothes and, and whatever the volume would be in kgs, you'll get some utensils. And then those clothes will further go for rug making. So, you know, there was there was an existed, existing market uh, for those clothes. And, and I think this exists for so many other streams. I mean, I, I just talked about the municipal solid waste recyclables or textiles. Um, something like shoe, you know, we often keep our shoes because someone comes at our doorstep or or maybe would walk around in the colony. And if you spot them, they can just, they'll just mend your shoes. You know, you don't have to throw them away. You know, so I, I think we don't really acknowledge the importance of, uh, you know, these actors in our lives because they're just yeah. there, you know, they're right there at our doorsteps. But I think, uh, and, and that's why I touched upon frugal economy, you know, practices that necessarily doesn't mean that we, we don't like spending, but practices which are so traditionally inherent in our culture that that saves resources. Um, I'm not sure over in a night global, uh, you know, countries in 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 uh, global north can can have these actors, but but I think uh, to learn from this is of course that that we really value our resources as a society. I'm not saying that there are not issues that that do not exist, be it waste management or be it sometimes. Um, making wrong decisions on technologies to manage our waste, but but then overall, culturally, as a society across countries in South Asia or global South, uh, I think these are some inherent in inbuilt practices that have been passed on um, to generations. I'm not sure I was I was able to answer Adam. No, no. I got really carried away, but no, maybe no. I'll <laughs> ask Mansoor and Alejandro to add on to this. Yeah. I, I, Please do Alejandro and, and, and then Mansour in that order. And can you keep them short? Because I've got another couple of questions I want to get in before we run out of time. So Alejandro first. 
Well, very short. Uh, I think that uh, when we talk about the the uh, save the planet, the planet is algo material, uh, unmaterial, yeah. But uh, several uh, cultures recognize the rights of the uh, uh, herd mother, the, the mother herd, the Pachamama in Bolivia or in some in some parts of uh, Peru of Colombia. I have the, the this this is maybe the main topic. It's not about the the the, the alienation with the idea, the behavior of the global north, <laughs> without this uh, 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 spiritual conception of, of 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 our environment. I think that if we take some parts of, of these ancient uh, behaviors, the uh, the indigenous behavior, um, I think that they have a, a very good way to do the things in good way is uh, when you talk about resources is is more natural that when you talk about waste waste is not natural <laughs> yeah uh, if you think in, in these cultural uh, ideas i think that is a is a good approach to the correct way to understand our uh, our interaction with the with the media with the environment thank you manso yeah, so my, my keywords, two keywords are attention and common sense. So for many, many decades, I used the example of uh, wheelbarrows and handcarts in my teaching. And I you said, do. look, I've uh, seen you do it as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, look, uh, there is no design for this, which is used by millions and millions of waste collectors in developing countries. We are in a similar situation in the North. Uh, if you go around and look at the separation bins, in many places, many big outlets, many brands and all that, how many of them are doing what they're intended to do? So just two keywords, attention and common sense. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Sweater, can we can we get the second poll question up? Audience, um, I'm, we're going to ask you to vote on, on a very specific question because I want to spend the last five minutes sort of thinking about this. But so coming back to what can the North learn from the South and, and, you know, we've also talked about what can the South learn from the North in this conversation already, but can you pick the one that you think, well, you can pick more than one, but don't go picking them all because then we don't actually get any insight whatsoever. But um, which areas do you think the North can learn most from the South? Is it good use of those fine, uh, fewer or, you know, uh, or financial resources? Is it the informal sector piece that we've talked a lot about? Is it simpler technologies? It's, it's been alluded to a little bit. Is it just innovation and creativity? I think we've talked a lot about innovation and, and, and entrepreneurialism um, or something about point of use payments. And I guess um, the, the Global South has a lot of pay as you throw and pay as you use type activities. So something to think about. If you can get your votes in while we carry on talking, that will be fantastic. Another question for the, um, for the audience though. There were, there were some of you that clearly didn't think the... Uh, global north could learn from the global south uh, when the, you did the original vote could you just tell me in the chat um, if you've changed your mind so have we gone from 89 percent to 75 percent because some of you have decided that the north can't now learn or have some of you gone actually i didn't think we could but th but they could so just let me know in the chat if you think there are you, you've changed your mind because i'm just interested to know whether there's been a swing at all during this conversation whilst you're also voting for this. And thank you. Sweater, let's have the results. Woof, hang about. I wasn't ready for those. Um, you're far too efficient. Um, and so what can the North learn from the South? This is interesting. So what we got, 65% innovation, creativity, 55% simple technologies, 30% informal recycling, 25% around the resources, um, what, are, what do we think, um, Alejandro? Does that, does that sort of align with your thinking or would you have picked something entirely different? Oh, really, really. Is, 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 I think that is very, uh, very in the same way. I, I, I think that we need to advance jointly. Uh, open innovation, uh, collective construction are necessary in this, in, in this world. Uh, the solutions are in, in some part and we need to work together. We live in a global, globalized world. Uh, the south and the north, uh, the west and the east <laughs> are, are larger than we perceive. Uh, I'm, uh, only a one human in one small part of uh, one uh, big city, but it's a small city with, with, uh, in comparison with others. And there are many possibilities uh, to, to develop uh, 
to to uh, go to the <laughs> sustainable development really other regions face the same problems and needs uh, as colombia in, in, uh, in the south global by why not observe their solutions and at that then uh, some situation in the north global uh, was, was similar in, in in some period of, of the history okay go ahead using the experience i think that uh, we have a lot of possibilities to create bridge of knowledge of work between south south and south north yep very good swati what about you uh, did, 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 did that tally with your thinking or is there a particular topic on there that you think we, well, sh we should be uh, pushing? I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit diplomatic here that I, I think both have to learn from each other, both Global South and Global North. While I agree uh, for Global North, uh, what's to pick up on is on affordable resource management systems, conscious consumerism, uh, you know, and minimalism and frugal systems, uh, I think, which, which Global South really has an expertise on and high time that these case studies are documented uh, along with their cost benefit analysis. I feel that's really important, but also there's a lot that can be learned from Global North in terms of continuous emission monitoring systems, having more robust uh, you know, monitoring and enforcement uh, mechanisms in place, um, having uh, effective planning uh, or, or more mm -hmm. effective implementation plans in place. So I think it's more like a two-way street and, and we both have to learn from each other uh, in, in these catastrophic times. Yeah. You're, you're doing a very good job of replacing me, Swate, and, and doing, the, doing the summary. So thank you for making my life easy. And the audience agree with you because there's lots of commentary about it's a two-way street. We learn from each other. It's all about best practice. It's all about understanding the circumstances and, and, and translating that. So I, I, I think you're absolutely spot on. Uh, Mansour, just your thoughts on on sort of the the commentary around what the the north could learn from the south. Was there anything on there that really stood out for you? Uh, Adam, every, everything, everything. Very well covered by Swati. <laughs> so I, I I maybe perhaps we use this time, but but I I I I'd also do some work on learning side, and I know learning in any way within organization, within country, between countries, historical learning is quite a challenging process overall. So we will talk about it in a separate webinar. <laughs> you're setting us up for a for a revisit um what can the south learn from the north discuss um listen really interesting thank you thank you very much audience you've been great i thank thank you for your commentary and for your your answers on some of these questions i think there's some great points in the chat for those of you that have not been monitoring it i love the fact that you know deposit return systems work equally well in the sudan and germany um they haven't worked in the UK since about the 1980s, but I think it's going to be interesting because we're looking to do them again. So I think that's quite an interesting space, isn't it? You know, what can we learn from those that have that have done it more recently? Um, there's some great questions about public uh, personal decision making, and we haven't really got into that. I mean, you know, people are people, and you know, I think when you when you look at the TV adverts, there's always this kind of commentary, isn't there? Oh, we all want to live like the Americans, and and, you know, everything's on tap. I'm not sure everybody does want to live like the Americans, if I'm honest. Um, and uh, But it is interesting that there's always this kind of tension between the, de the developing economies wanting to consume more and have more and buy stuff and be more fashionable, perhaps, when actually I think many of us in the North look to the South and go, I love the way that they do that. I love the way that they're repairing that. I love the fact that they're using local products. I, I, that two-way street is it's very right right now. I think you know technology where we started the conversation has really opened the door to we can see and learn from each other live. Um, it's not stories about you know exploration. It's suddenly it's just happening around us, and I think that's really positive. So, so I think it's been a really a really interesting session. My my final ask um, for the panel is about to is about to come, but I just want to ask the audience one more time. You've been great keep on this communication some of this content some of the references some of the detail some some of the amount of typing that's going on in this session is just unbelievable so make sure that this community keeps sharing you know who you are now don't don't disappear from the debate please and we'll build it be wasteful will help us build this because this is i think what's what this this platform is great at is connecting people in geographies who are actually facing very similar situations so so thank you and keep going 
Now, my question, because we're going to have to share the slides for everybody as well, Sweater, so people will get an opportunity to, to, to coordinate and, and, and join forces. But the question for my panel, before I hand back to Sweater, is if I was going to reuse a T-shirt, what would my hashtag be that I get printed on the front that would summarise uh, the lessons learned from this session? And look, it can't be a big T-shirt. I'm not a big guy, okay? So... Swati, what is going? Hashtag what's on my T-shirt? Because it's going on social media straight after this. I'm a conscious guy. Would that Ooh. fit in? <laughs> Hashtag, hang on, I'm writing it down. I'm a conscious guy. To be honest, I was going to have hashtag frugal because I just, that's that's rocking. So I'm having that one too on the back, all right? Okay. Thank you. S super, by the way. Love that. Alejandro, can you top Swati? What's your hashtag for me? Jesus Christ. Uh, oh, hashtag Jesus, no, Jesus Christ. No, no, no. Jesus no. Christ is, is the main. Is the, is, is the main word. <laughs> I think that work together. Work together. Work together. I'm, I'm making a note. That's going on my social in about five minutes' time. Thank you. Come on in, Mansour. Can you top these two? I think they've been very good. They've set the bar high. What's my hashtag takeaway message? I would, I would say value, value, value your waste. So that may be a bit long or smart waste something like that will do so i think i think that's that that, that could be interesting yeah value your waste i can get that or smart there. waste I can yeah get that's cool. listen audience ah hashtag work together hashtag refusals the first r oh hang on that's a deep one hashtag minimalist the audience are getting on board i need more than one t-shirt thankfully i've got loads of them in the cupboard i can reuse for the purpose so thank you very much for getting involved ah there we go hashtag value your waste well done awesome stuff um, it's been my pleasure. I love sharing these things. I learn plenty. It's been great revisiting the international dimension because it's been a while since I did some of this. So it's been great to hear that there's some really good stuff going on and we can continue to learn from one another. So thank you very much for letting me um, letting me enjoy myself. Sweater, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Mansoor, Swati and Alejandro. It's been a great session and uh, thanks for your hashtags. Uh, Mansoor, I really thought uh, your, your hashtag would be hashtag common sense because I think you're repeating that quite a few times. <laughs> yes. So yeah, good evening, good afternoon, uh, audience and to our speakers. Uh, the, this will go up on our YouTube channel in two weeks time. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a good day. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye.